to be more specific, Somalian pirates. Who knows Ireland? In 2007, the Seychelles government appointed former Irish Defence Force personnel to help them overhaul their national security. Little did they realize at the time that these men were about to come face to face with one of the oldest forms of international terrorism. We are very concerned about the future. Our captives are very impatient now that nobody has been in touch to enter into negotiations. When we got here, firstly, so piracy was unheard of and it, it burst that caught us all by surprise early in 2009. And our first direct experience of it was when uh, a fishing vessel with a number of Seychelles aboard went missing. And it was missing for a number of days and there was no communication, no radio contact. And finally we got a call from Somalia to basically say that they had them there, they were holding them hostage and they were looking for $10 million in ransom. So it was some shock, as you can imagine, to Seychelles to see that a small island a thousand miles away from Somalia could be threatened by Somali pirates. The Somali coastline is the most dangerous stretch of water in the world. In 2010, there were 445 pirate attacks, almost 1,200 hostages were seized, and millions of dollars in ransom was paid out. Somalia has 30 years since it's been a failed state. Now, 30 years without authorities, without structures, without police, um, does lead to, I would say, a unique brand of lawlessness. What started in Somalia was you had angry fishermen that started to attack foreign vessels that were in their waters. Illegally fishing? There was an element of illegal fishing, of illegal dumping of toxic materials. There were a lot of illegal activities taking place in the Somalias. They were, they were uh, taking EZ, advantage of the lawlessness. Taking advantage of the lawlessness. So you had essentially uh, some of the local communities that, that uh, hid back at that. That's how it started. But then some of them realized that, uh, yes, you seize these vessels, these vessels had a value. That's when the piracy, I would say, in its commercial aspect uh, started. This is the warlords, and, and I presume. This is where the warlords realized that if they put money into these ventures, you know, pay 10 boats, go out, see what they can bring back. They could either sell the vessels that were brought back for money, or they realized even more, if there were people on board these vessels, they could charge enormous ransoms. The Seychelles economy is highly dependent on tourism, which generates 70% of its external revenues, and fisheries. And the tourism is essentially maritime-based. See all these yachts tied up around us here. I mean, under normal conditions, many of these yachts would be, would be leased. They'd be out on the water. So the impact of piracy on Seychelles, like, it's my own personal opinion that, that no country in the region has been as adversely affected by piracy in proportional terms, in, in economic terms, as Seychelles. It really adversely affected its economy. This is how it works. There's 10 or 11 guys, that's the unit on the main ship. These barrels, that contains the diesel. They have a half barrel one of these which they cook on. They could stay for a month, these guys, looking for vessels. Now, when the attack takes place, these are the attack vessels. They can't be detected because they're so small and the waves at the sea, radar can't pick them up. So they, they do a dawn raid and basically everybody's half asleep. The first guy goes up from this, throws the ladder up. He's on an eighth share of whatever they take. Half of the money is gone by the finance, the fellow pays for the boat, and the rest for the people that do it, they share it. This guy, the first over, he's got a Kalashnikov on, the, on his back. He's up the ladder, straight into the wheelhouse, opens fire, or takes everybody, and immediately, these guys, it's more than their job's worth, and they just put their hands up. Many of these ventures would be unsuccessful, but if you're lucky enough to be part of a successful hijack, the returns are exceptionally high, you know, with, with maybe a 1,000, 1,200% profit for your initial investment. It's extraordinary. So it, it, it's an extraordinary business model, and Lowes, though I am to say it, it must be one of the most profitable business models in the world. While we were there, news broke that a Seychellois fishing vessel had been captured by Somali pirates. I wanted to hear firsthand what the experience was like. In 2009, Francis Ruku was one of the first Seychellois to be taken. He spent 88 days in captivity in Somalia. 
the method they used was the, the skiff with the attack yeah, boats? Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. The skiff and the, the mother ship. And when they came on board, they just shot next to my feet and over my head. That must have been horrendous. Yes. Once we got to Somalia, they started the negotiation. The negotiation started with the Seychelles. And the worst part was the, the, the time that we spent on land. And this, I'll tell you, it was very tough. It's very hard. Yeah. And the, how much was the initial uh, demand? At the beginning, it was around four, four million dollars, asking four million dollars. And then they went down, 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 and then we were released like that. The details of the negotiations have never been officially revealed by the Seychelles government. But Francis and the six members of his crew were released unharmed. This has developed into something else now, hasn't it, since you came back? Yes. Because we know you are involved in negotiations at the moment for a ship that has been taken in the last few days. Yes, because what happened when we were in Somalia, there was a, a committee here in Seychelles, and there were two Irish that were involved in the negotiation committee. This is Declan and Nile. Yes, and now also I'm part of the team. So you, you helped them uh, with the psychology of the situation, yes, yes. Where, where people might be in their heads and... Yes, yes. When the hostage crisis broke, the Seychelles government realized they had at their disposal two Irish specialists in counter-terrorism. When you came over, what, 2004 originally, was it? Yes. Did you see yourself in 2011 being in a hostage negotiation room? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely not. when I came over, it was basically, largely I, I felt on an education brief. So, 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 so this is quite different. So how did you, I mean, how did you feel when you found I'm, yourself in those positions? I don't believe I reacted any differently to any other army officer who would have been in that room. Um, so essentially, you're, you're taught to detach yourself from the emotion of the situation as best you can, uh, and, and then to focus on the achievement of the mission. And if there's one thing that defines army people um, from all aspects of the army, it's you've got to achieve the mission. Okay. And the mission in this, it, you know, in this context, the mission narrows down to a very sharp focus. Stop them going to Somalia. And military people are termed to think in terms of what's my overall situation, what are my options. What are the constraints? And they iteratively reduce them down to whatever needs to be done with the minimum use of force to solve the problem. As we know, you're the head of the Financial Investigations Unit. How does that correspond with your particular involvement in, in, in piracy, your direct involvement? Ooh, um, the FIU would have an interest in, in piracy straight away because it's, it's an organised criminal activity and the financial trail, the financial streams are essentially a driving motivator for, for piracy. The ransom of $2 million was ferried in a dinghy to a pirate speedboat. Officially, no government will admit to paying ransoms. Yet hostages continue to be released, and Somali pirates continue to make large profits. But now, the Seychelles government has decided to lay down the law. The global response has to be one of law enforcement. And this is where the key issue is, how do we look at the ocean? The problem when, when looking at the ocean is a lot of the ocean is not under the control of any individual state. Now, if a crime is committed in these international waters, there is the principle under the law of the sea of universal jurisdiction, meaning that any state has the right to prosecute a crime that has taken place. Now, that's the theory. In practice, as soon as anybody hears that there's Somali pirates, oh, we don't want them in our prisons. In 2009, the Seychelles government began a systematic program to deal with the piracy crisis. They developed unique legislation, which meant that they became the first country to arrest and prosecute Somalian pirates. They also set about transforming their local coast guard into a maritime security unit. So the response of the Seychelles government to piracy was essentially the response of a national sovereign jurisdiction fighting for its survival, fighting for its ongoing existence and essentially they decided that they would do everything that they possibly could to stop Seychelles hostages being taken back to Somalia. Okay guys just check each other okay straight down the interceptor. We'll Once more Declan Barber drew on the Irish connection and drafted in ex-Irish Army Ranger Seamus Griffin to train up a specialist Navy assault team. In a very short